So on the question of BBI, uh, Mr. President, uh, we know that the handshake has uh, sort of guaranteed s some level of po political tranquility in the country over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and that process was meant to culminate in a certain draft of reforms uh, which are contained in the BBI document. Mm -hmm. uh, given that um, uh, the, the courts have taken uh, the decision that they have taken, mm -hmm. uh, I think the country would like to know first what your reaction is to, uh, to that matter. Mm -hmm. And also, secondly, uh, where do you see uh, those, that basket of reforms, where do you see it uh, moving mm -hmm. next? But I'm glad how you started, Mutuma, because uh, it is correct, and I'm glad you still recognize the fact that uh, the handshake did bring a level of tranquility into this republic after the 2017 uh, elections. And uh, it's unfortunate that uh, we have such short memories because if many of you would try and uh, look back at that uh, particular time, I think you can uh, remember the tension that was in the country, the violence that uh, was occasioned in some parts of the country, and uh, the fact that we were in a very uncomfortable situation as a country between uh, the uh, election, both elections, and actually all the way through till January. And it was upon seeing a possibility of another crisis erupting similar to the one that we saw in 2007. I decided that this country doesn't deserve that. And I thought and I took it upon myself to reach out to those who were opposing the election and led by the Honorable Riley in Odinga. And I said, uh, you know, we need to engage because at the end of the day, we are both citizens of this republic. Whatever our personal feelings or views or those of our supporters may be, we have a responsibility as leaders to ensure that uh, this country does not uh, find itself in a similar situation. And uh, as I have said severally, again, you know, people forget that uh, it was a very difficult time. I mean, uh, he wasn't willing. I was also very cagey because uh, of the situation, the way it was. But at the end of the day, we were able to talk. And through those discussions, we were able actually to get to some underlying issues that have plagued this country for a long time. And it was then we said that, you know, if only people could learn to sit down and talk the way we are talking, a lot of these problems wouldn't happen. And it was there that, and I really appreciated this fact, because for the first time we said, let's not even talk about government. Let's not even talk about who's in government, who's not in government. Let us talk about these underlying factors. Let us actually come together and say, how can we deal with these issues to ensure that going forward, Kenya will never find itself ever again in this kind of a situation. And we started discussing those underlying factors. And that is what led to what we called our nine point issues that we ourselves thought that led to the handshake and that led to say we will work together on these fundamental issues that we share as Kenyans, as two Kenyan leaders. And we decided then let us expand this because after all there are also other leaders and that's why we also brought others on board including some of those unfortunately who for short-term political reasons are opposed to this particular process, were brought on board. And we said, let us discuss these issues. Why do we consistently have this issue? And one of the issues we figured out that is still very pertinent even to me was the fact that people feel that if one side wins, another side loses. So we felt we've got to come up with a situation where nobody loses. And what does that mean? It means two primary issues equity and inclusivity. And how can we handle these? But we also said, let us go out also into the country and here. There are probably other issues. Young people was another issue because there is growing frustration also about you know, 
in and amongst our young people? How, how do we also bring them on board, cater for their, let's get their opinions, let's hear what they have to say. And that actually was the foundation of what today we call BBI. A process that was meant to be inclusive, that was inclusive. I've actually never seen a more inclusive process save for the process. Again, led by Raila Odinga and uh, the Honorable uh, Mwai Kibaki, former president, that led to the constitution of 2021. That sought to put all these issues across. And then said, if we rectified these issues, we would then be in a position to say, OK, let's go for an election and have the best of hope that what we have seen in the past, starting all the way from when we started multi-party politics and the violence that we see in elections, the divisions that we see in the country, the ethnic animosity that we see in the country, that if we started dealing with some of these issues, maybe some of this thing would disappear. That was what BBI was supposed to represent. And it is most unfortunate, like I keep saying, that people have forgotten why we were looking at this. And for short-term political gain, have decided to deny Kenyans of what is legitimately in their interest. Because let me ask, one of the things that we used to talk about and we used to say, when you have a situation if you go into our informal settlements and you go into a lot of these other areas, why do you have such tension? Why do you have such poverty? Then you get and you find out because it is both about representation, but it is also about resources. Because when we introduce CDF, CDF we are also attached to the constituency. So when you have an honorable member of parliament receiving 100 million shillings and another one receiving 100 million shillings, one is distributing 100 million shillings to 50,000 people. Another is distributing 100 million shillings to 1 million people. Is that equity? Is that child in Madare or Kibera? Will he ever have an opportunity ever of going to university if the highest bursary he can ever receive is 5,000 shillings? And we said, if we don't deal with some of these issues, people will consistently feel pent up. And that is why we said, let us actually focus ourselves on this. Let us do it. It was not about who was going to be president, who was not going to be president. Who How many times have I told you people, I am very grateful to the almighty God and the people of Kenya for the opportunity they've given me. I am more than happy to serve out my time and finish my program. But I also believe that this is part of my agenda, to be able to bring people together and to be able to ensure that we have a peaceful, stable, united country. And that is why I was very keen on this. Unfortunately, the courts have ruled the way they have ruled, and I believe that uh, they have been highly misguided in that process. Unfortunately, we have had politicians, like I'm saying, for short-term political gains, who have deviated from why we wanted the BBI to it being an issue of competition. And I don't know why, because all of these people, I mean, they, they, I was hearing some people say, I see this BBI is to propel Raila Odinga. Raila Odinga declared his presidency with or without BBI, and he's still on the ticket. BBI has nothing to do with his candidacy. BBI has nothing to do with Uhuru wanting to continue because there is no clause in BBI that says that the incumbent president is going to continue for another 10 years. There is no clause. This is all propaganda and hype that is built around to poison the people's minds and to deviate them from looking at the real facts. Because at the end of the day, who are the people who suffer when we have these po political problems? It is not the elite, it is the masses. Who are the people who are denied resources when we don't deal with these issues of inequity? It is the people, not the elite, but somehow now, you will now want to blame poverty on that class as opposed to that class. Instead of dealing with the fundamental root cause of the problem, which is providing resources, giving opportunities to every Kenyan equally and fairly, you want to now make it an us versus them because it's an easy campaign platform, right? 
to propel an individual to victory as opposed to dealing with the underlying problem facing a nation. So, ladies and gentlemen, all I can say is it is unfortunate. Uh, I am a person who has always respected the rule of law. I always told you, and even when they said, uh, that we are going to take, I said when I was uh, vying for my very first time, that regardless of whether I'm chosen by or elected or not elected, I will still obey the uh, International Criminal Court. I don't speak what I don't mean. You have seen, I proved myself. I was elected and I still appeared because I believe in the rule of law. When they went out and they said my election was null and void, I accepted, moved on. And even this one, I will accept and move on. I don't agree with it because I believe we have denied Kenyans their resources. We have denied Kenyans equity. We have denied funds to go machinani through the ward fund, which to me is actually a much more equitable way of ensuring mtoto wa machinani ameweza kupata elimu ya university kuliko CDF. All right? So this is what Kenyans have lost. I, Uhuru, have not lost anything. Just the, 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 the feeling of, 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 of sadness that we could actually, for political reasons, deny our own people something that would have not only improved their lives and livelihoods, but made Kenya that much more a cohesive society. So um, in terms of uh, where do we go from here? Well, I'm not the only proponent of uh, these changes. I will not give up. I always believe that uh, one must fight for those things that he believes in, whether in office or out of office. I will continue to fight and advocate for those things that I believe in. And I believe strongly that as a country, we need to be fair. I need believe we need to be able to shed this ethnic umbrella that we always say that so and so, because at the end of the day, we're all Kenyans and we need each other. Your child and your child and your child needs an education, needs access to health, needs good roads, just like any other child in any other part of the world. You're entitled to it. And it is my hope and my prayer that like-minded people who believe in these fundamental principles and who believe and see Kenya long into the future and not within the context of their political life, yeah? we'll continue to advocate for these things until we have a much more fairer and much more just society. So as of now, like I said, that is where we are. We have a ruling, we obey, and we move on and we continue to consult with people who think the same as we do. And we will continue to work together to see that we overcome these challenges and uh, get the Kenya that we want to, to see, that we want our children to inherit. I'm sure you know all the people who have declared an interest in the presidency. Uh, you've worked with them, you've done politics with them. Um, um, is there one that you think is best suited? I won't, I won't ask uh, who, but is there one that you have found who has the qualities and... It, it, it is not my duty, nor is it my responsibility to tell people or to tell Kenyans how or where they should vote. But it is my duty to remind Kenyans that they need to look at who they vote for and why they are voting for that particular person. And like I'm saying, it is unfortunate that within and amongst us, there are those who will sacrifice interest over personal political agendas. And I believe these are the things that Kenyans need to look for. But at the end of the day, it is not for me to dictate to Kenyans who to elect. It is for Kenyans to decide what is in their best interest. And my hope and my prayer is that they would do that in a manner that looks after, not their short-term interests, but their long-term survivability as citizens, and the long-term stability of our nation. Thank you, Excellency. I really hope uh, my colleague Mutuma would uh, 
make a follow up question about BBI, yeah. especially now that, that there is one more, you know, the court left, mm-hmm. the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've been writing stories about, uh, you know, we are not, if, uh, we are not very, very clear whether we are, whether you are going to appeal again. You know, for, for me, like I said, the biggest disappointment is uh, what Kenyans have lost and what our courts have denied them. I, I must make it clear, I do not agree with their ruling. You know, when, <laughs> when they sit and they say that the IABC is illegally constituted, the same IABC that swore in the same court and the same judges, when they say IABC was not properly constituted, the same IABC that has conducted 27 by-elections and we have not heard anybody say that there is a problem with those elections. You know, I have a lot of problems with it. But equally at the same time, like I'm saying, it is not my baby alone. This is the people's baby. And it is the people themselves who will decide. And there are others, like I said, like-minded, and we will continue to consult. But I personally have no interest in continuing an unnecessary court battle, because like I said, it is not about this thing being done when I'm president or when I'm not president, but it's the question of whether the principle and the issues that we're talking about are just and right. And if they are, they will happen now, and if they don't happen now, they will happen tomorrow. And we will continue to advocate and to fight for those things, because we believe in them. And we believe it is what this country needs, right? And that is why, and I repeat again, I will continue to also work with like-minded leaders to say, how are we going to ensure that this which we were trying to put together doesn't get lost? And we will find the best way forward, be it now, be it tomorrow, be it whatever. The point are, are the issues just? Are they right? And if they are, then as well-meaning individuals, we must continue to fight for them, however long however long they take, because that is what is going to be required to get the country that we all are desirous to see, a peaceful, stable, secure, prosperous nation that is inclusive. So the, I think as a follow-up to the politics, we've been writing these stories and uh, I'm sure all Kenyans have been, we're having a very, very interesting scenario, the relationship with their deputy, and there is, uh, I mean, the whole agitation around it. There are people who think that probably it's not right to criticize the government in the same way, I mean, they're still in, in the office. But uh, what takes it further is the fact that uh, you're still in office and uh, you're making this, maybe throwing tantrum and stuff from a government facility, from a government position enjoying all the parks, but uh, criticizing and being very critical on all these other things that uh, are coming from our government, which you're part of. Would you think, or uh, it would be a good idea probably to, I know it's not probably part of your agenda, but uh, it would be nice for you if uh, probably this person stepped out and then you then they can probably... Let me, let, me, let me frame it this way. I mean... In any decent civilized society where people disagree, yeah, all right, uh, the honorable thing that leaders do is to say, I disagree with the policies of this government, and therefore I wish to disassociate myself from them, and you tender your resignation. I wish this is what people would also do, you know, because as they say, you can't live in a glass house and also throw stones. You're in the same house and you're also throwing stones to demolish it, right? Okay? Uh, I have tried as much as possible to make sure that everything that we do, I keep everybody also within government involved and even some of those people who are criticizing have been part and parcel, yeah? And this is why I'm saying it's very unfortunate, yeah? But like I want to reiterate, you know, uh, I have an agenda that I was uh, elected on, and, 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 and that work must continue. And it would be really the honorable thing that if you are not happy with it, 
right? That you would actually, you know, uh, step aside and allow those who want to move on, move on, and then take your agenda to the people, which is what happens in any normal, you know, democracy, because you can't have your cake uh, <laughs> and, 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 and eat it, yeah? You know, you can't on the one hand say, I'm not going, and because I, at the same time, I don't agree. You know, you, you've got to decide, because you, you must be principled in, 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 in that endeavor. Yeah? Um, uh, that, that's what happens in a, in, a, in, a, in a democracy, so that you don't confuse people, you know? You know, on the one hand, you want to sing the praises of a government, that you are saying that, yes, you know, this is, we have done, we have done, we have done, and you want to ride on them. But yet on the other side of your mouth, you're talking another language. So I, I don't want to say much, but like I'm saying, uh, I will not be deviated from the agenda I have set on course. BBI was just one of them. We still have also the big four, which we have been consistently following, and we will continue uh, with the agenda as we have it. Um, that will continue, and uh, really, like I said, you know, we, people know what happens when, when you disagree with each other in, in, in developed civilized democracies, what people do, you know? And I would hope that people would have the courage and the guts to do that instead of, like I'm saying, throwing stones in the same house that you're living in. Listening to you um, and past interviews that have been done specifically on your deputy, when we have posed the question of what really happened, what really transpired uh, between 2013 and 2017 and now 2017 to 2021, and the answer has always been, ask the president. Now that the president is here, I, what I, really I have happened? no idea what has transpired, except for the fact that probably he is trying to create a base for him and for his future politics, which is his right. I have never denied him that, and he, he's free to do so. But I feel it is unfortunate that maybe the manner in which he is doing it uh, by going against the same government that he's serving, I think is wrong. Because like I said, the issues that we have been trying to fight over in this BBI and to try and achieve in this BBI are the same issues that brought me and him together, right? So if I want to now expand that, because I believed and I thought that that is what we were trying to do, and if you go back all the way back to 2013, it was always been my agenda, bringing the people of Kenya together. So if divisions of 2007 brought us together, why can't we now have these other divisions also bringing more on board? What is the problem with that? It doesn't deny you of your chances because at the end of the day, it is not Uhuru who elects, yeah? It is the people of Kenya. So what is the problem if we have more on board and have a situation where everybody feels that regardless of who wins, no Kenyan has lost and every Kenyan can leave feeling a winner? And, 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 and uh, I will continue to, to advocate for that, like I said, because I believe in it. I love my country, I love, I love peace, and that's why I, I have been trying to, to, to get this, not because I hate somebody or I don't like somebody, but because I think it is in the best interest of this country, right? if we were able to overcome our five-year political term without creating deep-seated animosities that continue to grow. Uh, and, 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 and it's not just in this, it's in everything that I've, I've, I've done. I've tried to follow you know, that principle of trying to understand what is the problem and trying to fix it. I'll give you an example. You know, we've consistently, it's, and it's been on the cards always, everybody, uh, land injustices, this, this, or this, or... I, I have never fought anywhere. I said, okay, we have this problem, and especially around the coast, right? So let's stop weaponizing it, and let's sit down. And I brought people, and I said, look, you, 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 you must lose you, 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 your, your, your uh, absentee landlords. You know, the local leadership, come, let's sit around the table, let's find a solution to this problem. And by sitting around the table and talking, we have begun to find solutions. We are now in the process of issuing title deeds to people. Those families are no longer fighting each other. They have agreed. All of them are happy, and we are moving on. We have found solutions. That is what we did in Likoni, right? 
an issue that was always a hot political hot potato every election come in come out people are fighting yeah this is why tiki again you know in, we sat down with the local leadership, we sat down with the owner of the land, and we found a solution. A legal solution, and a solution that was a win-win for all the parties concerned. That has been my principle, that has been my belief, and even now, even in politics, like I say, it is not about who, but it is about whether our country win, whether our people win. And if we win, then we should all be happy. And that cannot happen if people can't engage if we cannot open our doors and open our arms. And that is all I've done. And I will continue to do so because I believe any responsible leader would like to leave a country better than he or she found it. And that is my intention. They're talking about opening your arms. Uh, let's take it back to 2018 for the handshake. And thereafter, even bringing together all the other opposition leaders. We've seen you meet them in Mombasa, here at State House Nairobi. And there's always been this feeling like it's you're, you're trying to manage your succession at the exclusion of your deputy. Would that be the case? For what reason? The only, the, if he were to embrace this process that we were, the only reason he's been, because he's been anti, the, how, you don't call somebody who is against what you're trying to do. He has been opposed to it. For what reason, I don't know, but he has been opposed to it. Those meetings have not been about selecting a candidate. It's by saying, what is it that we agree? Do we agree on this? How do we, how do we birth this baby yeah? that we are all believing in, right? Nobody wants to leave anybody out because at the end of the day, like I'm saying, if we can actually come together and find people of common mind who want to push a particular agenda, then you have to do it, right? But you can't bring on board who is opposed and, and, and literally doesn't want to see it happen. And I, I fail to understand because you've been part of the process. It would have been wonderful had we all walked together as Kenyans, right? That's what we did from the, even when we went to Bomas. You know, didn't we all say, let us come together, right? But then all of a sudden, people are, we don't want it. We don't want it. We don't want it. We don't want it. So, you know, you, you, you can't force somebody something that somebody doesn't want down their throat you know it's that's also not democratic yeah you have to allow democracy to prevail right and like i'm saying even on this issue democracy is what will prevail people will decide for themselves which way they wish to go do you think handshake was a good thing for the jubilee administration or it has oh, ended up being I, I, problems i i will never 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 regret anything i told you Anything that brings peace and solutions, I will always be there. And I will do it again and again. And I will reach out even to more, right? Because for me, like I said, it is about not this political cycle. It is about that Kenya that will be there long after all of us are uh, nowhere in positions of influence. And I want to be remembered that at least I may not succeed. But at least I try to do something. And I try to do the right thing at the right time. Mr. President, yes. um, as we go towards the close of your term, it's clear that the economy is becoming a big point of conversation. Uh, that's why we're having all this talk about bottom up, bottom down, top down, you know. Uh, could we just get uh, your view of what the state of the economy is, uh, what are the paid points in there, what's going well for us, and the road you would want to point to your successor uh, as we continue into the future? Well, I think the first thing, uh, first and foremost, we must all acknowledge that uh, we have had a very difficult two years. And this is not just Kenya, it's, it's, it's a global it's a, it's, a, it's a global phenomenon occasioned by this uh, plague that has hit us, a plague that has necessitated uh, you know, a slowdown of the global economy, and this we have seen. And uh, therefore, I must admit that I am not where I would have preferred to be 
under normal circumstances, had we been in a position to continue our agenda, because we had started to see our tourism was picking up. We had started to see our agriculture picking up. We had started to see uh, our, our, our uh, financial sector picking up. We were putting in a lot of money uh, into all these uh, uh, small and medium enterprises with a view you know, of trying to see how we can ensure that they become proper job creators and stable what you call the, 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 the Juakali sector, the informal sector. We were working to see how to formalize it. In fact, some of the issues even in BBI itself were trying to address themselves to some of those issues. You know, how, how, how to give our, 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 our young people, you know, interest-free loans, right? And, and guaranteeing them both in law um, and constitution so that they can begin their startups and their small businesses. This was the direction that we headed in. Unfortunately, like I said, COVID has hit us, but we are still trying to keep our eye on the ball. And that's why we have come up with some of these interventions like uh, Kazim Taani amongst others. These are interventions that we brought on board, right? To help cushion uh, 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 um, our people from the uh, effects of COVID. But ultimately, it is the long-term programs. It is getting the road infrastructure so that, you know, a honey farmer in, 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 in Kitui can bring his product to market. You know, uh, this issue of inaccessibility. This is the, the whole agenda against electrifying our country, right? You know, when I took over, only 32% of Kenyans had power. Today, as we speak, yeah, 78% of Kenyans have power. Getting power to the people, right? To ensure that people are able to do their cottage industries, to make sure that they're able to do their juakali uh, um, um, businesses in their respective areas. This is creating opportunity at the grassroots level. This is why we're very keen to see even more resources going down to the grassroots level and less being controlled from the central government. Because the more resources you are able to push out into our counties, the more opportunities you are also creating because those tenders, those contracts are not just consigned here in the capital, but they are also everywhere, you know, across, across our country. So our infrastructure agenda, our program of now what you are seeing us going into our informal settlements, doing the roads, doing the power, doing the sewer lines. You should go and see for yourself. Changing their lives and creating opportunities instead of them being dens of, of, of uh, 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 um, despair. We are trying to make them places of hope that I can be in, in my, but now I have a road. I, I, I can get myself home. I can start my own small biashara there and work from there. Uh, there's a road that will bring people to me. Right? So that I don't have to go out to look for opportunity. I can find opportunity, you know, where I am. That is why we're opening up Lamu Port to create. We are now working to see how we can create a huge, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, um, a special economic zone. And we have a number of countries already highly interested in coming now to set up factories in Lamu, just as they are equally interested in setting up in Naivasha, where we have now brought the railway. And you will start to see some of these things. They're not going to happen overnight, but especially now with this lockdown, it has slowed us down. But we had wanted to see those kind of industries now establishing themselves in Naivasha. That's why we're moving the train all the way to Kisumu. That's why we're revamping Kisumu port. That's why we want to go out and do the special economic zone, but without access, without the rail, without power, right? That's why this new Lesos line is going through to bring and to stabilize power in the whole of the Nyanza and Western regions, right? So that these places now, once again, become interesting, right? For investment, for job creation, for job opportunity. And you can see that we're focused. You can see what we're doing, our tea reforms. You can now start to see the prices of tea themselves. They're improving. Why? Because of the reforms, and these are the reforms you've done. Yeah, despite all the noise people are making, go to the average, they will tell you their prices are improving. Talk to the same, to the coffee farmer, they'll tell you their prices are improving. We've now got BT cotton that we're trying to establish and grow. That's why I revived Kikomi. Those are opportunities for our young people. That's why we're reviving places like KMC.
so that our livestock farmers can have a place to deliver their livestock and be paid promptly huh? and with decent prices instead of going through middlemen. That is why we are continuing to see how we're going to revive even Mountex because we want to have that whole area, region of that Meru through to Zaraka, uh, Kenny, that whole side is huge cotton potential. We want to open it up. We want that plant there. We've got now companies now wanting now, so long as we're now doing the backward linkages with the farmer, who want to come up and re-establish the ginneries. So we're not just going to be importing materials and stitching, but we will be growing the cotton, ginning the cotton, making the material, and ultimately making the clothing that we see on the shelves in supermarkets, all that. These are all creating opportunities for a new Kenya. Right? That is what we are doing out there in Konza. Go and see what is happening at Konza. We are creating that infrastructure to create our silicon, uh, or as we are calling it, our uh, silicon savanna, right? Again, to create a place where our minds, our high-tech kids who understand this business have a place to be able to outreach and, 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 and be able to, 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 to uh, um, uh, take advantage with all the necessary infrastructure around them. Our 5G, as we've been pushing as a government to ensure we license these people to bring 5G so that in your industry, our cartoonists, uh, everybody has the opportunity to have the right kind of infrastructure ready for these young, talented people who, who, who are artists and creatives to be able to, to, to have an opportunity to put their talent to good use, but also to create jobs for their fellow young people. So, so this is the general direction. And that's why I said, for our people, what they want is to be given opportunity, not handouts. Right? They want to be given a chance to make the best of who they are and what they are. And that you can only do by creating the infrastructure by creating a, a, the tools that are necessary right, to enable them to get uh, those jobs. Not, 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 not through promising handouts or you, know, you get this and you get that. Nothing comes from nothing. But at the same time, we cannot uh, expect our, our young people to, to, to be able to be the best they can be without creating that infrastructure that is going to be supportive to enable them to actually achieve that which they wish to achieve. So, so um, me, I'm not a person who believes in anxiety because, you know, these things don't happen. Not, these things, they don't happen, you know, at the snap of your fingers. They take work. Huh? Uh, I, I was talking to somebody over, 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 over the weekend who said, oh, how can you as hosting under 20 like it's just happened? Uh, we've been working on this for the last almost six years, right? To get to where we are, right? And this is also just a stopover so that by 2025, we can actually host the first African country to host uh, World Athletics, the championships, will be the first African country. And I believe our bid will be successful. But it is because of all the steps that have gone on previously. It's not that you just wake up in the morning and it, uh, it happens. Everything has to, you've got to put the work behind it, right? And, 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 and like I said, we, we are now going through very difficult times, especially because all these COVID issues have slowed down a lot of the programs and plans that we had. But I am very, very hopeful and, and, and I'm very encouraged by the fact that despite all those challenges, if we compare ourselves with many countries, Kenya has fared very well. Not that we have not had our challenges, our difficulties, but we have actually fared far better than most. And I believe that if we continued working together in this spirit, we will do even better and we will come out of this particular problem even stronger, both economically, but also with very bright prospects for the future. In the same economic space, uh, the elephant in the, in the room in Kenya has been the issue of corruption. And uh, during this, uh, your second term, uh, you came out up front uh, very clearly uh, on the fight against corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I'm wondering as you near the end of your term, uh, when you look back and the status where we are now, what's your view of, of, of this? I will say that we, as, as, as a government, have done the best that we can. And even if you actually look at the situation as it exists, new cases of corruption these days are few and very far between, if you look at it over, over the years. The key problem that we have today is not tackling corruption as much as handling the corruption cases that are still pending. And I believe, because this is, this is the only thing that now will prove to the world and to Kenyans that we are serious. Exactly. That our investigative agencies, who are independent, that our judicial uh, fellows, who are also equally independent, will do that which is right to bring these cases that are at conclusion. Because for us, as far as we are concerned, we have definitely the case is there, if you want. I mean, I don't want to, it's not my department, but I would encourage you, go to both anti-corruption, go to uh, DCI and all the other fellows who are in charge of those uh, uh, agencies. Go see yourself the number of files already before court that are waiting adjudication, right? My hope and my prayer is that these can be adjudicated in the shortest possible time because the ultimate the ultimate weapon against ensuring that our fight against corruption succeeds is conviction. And that is out of my hands. That is in the hands of other independent institutions who, as you have seen, you cannot say that I am biased or I am objecting to them. When they rule already against me, they have ruled against my, my, own, my own election. They have ruled against, twice against, something that I have been pushing. So you can't say I'm the one who's holding them back. Tell them, do your job. Kenyans are waiting for you to do your job quickly and bring these. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited because uh, when, when, when I, I watched uh, the, the, the new CJ, when, when she was uh, giving her first uh, statement, when she was sworn in, um, and, and she said that that was going to be her number one agenda. I hope and pray for her. Yeah? And I believe many Kenyans are waiting to see whether that promise she made us will be delivered. Your government, and particularly yourself, has been accused of weaponizing the war against corruption uh, to deal with those that probably don't agree with you. I have never. I will never, right? Okay. If anybody has a case against, and they can claim and show that I have weaponized, or I have used any agency to look after so and so, so and so, so let them say, all right, all right. In this process, many of you will know from the first time to now, I have lost people very close to me, yeah, who I was forced to ask to step down, all right, okay because of the cases that were before them. I have no intention, right? I know what it feels like to be wrongly victimized, like I was done when I was taken to The Hague. I was wrongly victimized, but I stood my ground, like I promised and I said, and I went before them, and I faced my accuser, and I proved, and I was proved innocent. So rather than people try to find this or this or this. I have no such intention. Go to your accuser. Go before the courts of law, right? Prove your innocence. If you're in, I'm as happy as you are. Why should we want a, an, an innocent person prosecuted? For what? For what benefit? Yeah? Yeah? Just like you, Ashuri, if you have a case against, go take it to court. Take the evidence where it's supposed to go, you know? And let the people go ahead with what they need to do, yeah? But don't always, you know, th this is what I'm saying, these short-term political gains, you know, uh, I, 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 something happens to you, oh, it is because I spoke against the president, oh, the president wants to, oh, my friend, 
This is not that Kenya of the 80s and 90s, my friend. This, this is a new Kenya, right? These institutions are independent. These same people, are. The, I, 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 I may appoint them, they are, they, are, they are vetted by the National Assembly. Those powers are not such as they used to be. So let us be practical, let us be frank. Yeah? Kila mtu wa bebe mzigo wake, usiende kuwekelea mwenzako. Wewe kama umekua, kwe, mimi hata mimi nimewekelewa. Yeah? Right? Mimi si kuenda kulia, kusema sijui ni nani. Mimi nasema, basi, nani kaena, nani kajitetea, nani kajiondoa. Sasa hata wewe jameni, badala ya kuenda kutafuta ati ni hii, ni hii, ni hii. Kama umesemekana, umefanya, siwende, uoneshe, ujafanya. Yeah? Kwa nini ulete siya saduni? Yeah. The balance that your government is making in managing this pandemic, this having mm. the economy, you know, mm. lives versus the economy and livelihoods. Mm. What, what I, are you I, 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 I will never, just as in the scenario that we were talking about, the country as a whole, uh, when we were talking about political violence and all of those things, I have seen, and I will never do anything that, in my view, will jeopardize the life of a Kenyan. A life of a Kenyan is greater than anything else. Let us withstand the challenges and be alive. We shall overcome those challenges tomorrow. But a life lost today shall never be recovered. So my focus, and it will continue to be my focus, is to ensure that I protect and I safeguard the lives of the people of Kenya. That is the thrust and the core of the oath I took when I swore to take over this office. And it's on COVID, uh, because COVID is a very serious problem. We've seen what um, uh, has happened in other places, in India, in the US, and all that. Uh, so far, I think we have gotten off rather lightly, uh, for whatever reason, maybe uh, well, constitution, or maybe we, we are a lot healthier than we expected. There are two two major issues uh, for us to be able to weather this storm and open our economy and and proceed in the way we we plan to proceed with our lives. We need to be vaccinated, uh, and the vaccines have two issues. One is a supply that the supply just isn't there. And also, maybe the second one being a growing uh, skepticism among certain people uh, uh, towards vaccines. What would you say to those who, uh, where the vaccine is available, they, they, they are unwilling to take it? And what would you say about the question of supply? Uh, are we looking forward to, to stronger, maybe better supply of, of, of vaccines? My position on that has been very clear and uh, both as uh, I had the opportunity being a member of, 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 of the uh, Bureau of the African Union in the year of COVID. Right? So I was part and parcel uh, together with my colleagues from DRC, South Africa, uh, Egypt, uh, in how we were working together with Africa CDC and others in this fight against uh, COVID. And for the first time, uh, and this is on record, Africa together has never been more prepared to face a pandemic than we were to face this particular challenge. We had worked it all the way through, including well before vaccines were actually uh, uh, um, uh, call to be safe, created the COVAX facility, working with our development partners. But the one thing, and we were ready to roll out vaccines as soon as they became available. We had actually already contracted the Serum Institute of India, right? That was supposed to have been the main supplier. And it was said because they had the largest facility to main supplier of COVAX, which was going to be the instrument of making sure that Africa was on the front line of receiving vaccines as soon as they became available. It is most unfortunate that despite all of that, when vaccines came online, the developed countries exercised what we are unashamedly calling vaccine apartheid. 
Because despite all the arrangements and agreements that we had in place, vaccine nationalism came into effect. They decided to hoard and to look after themselves and ignore the rest of the world. It was a double blow for us on the African continent because on top of that, the uh, uh, facility that had been contracted to supply us, India itself, that was part of us, said they were no longer going to be supplying until they supply their own people when they are hit with the second wave. So we were left stranded, right? Despite the fact that we had never been better prepared, despite the fact that we had put our resources, mobilized all the resources that were necessary to begin immediate rollout. So where, do we, uh, where are we and where are we going from here? We are still in that fight of ensuring and we're now looking forward with uh, South Africa now coming on board. We are working on getting our fill and for, uh, uh, form and fill uh, um, uh, facility here in Kenya, but South Africa already has theirs on board. We are hopefully now going to start getting a steady supply of our own vaccine, and hopefully we may be a month or two months late, but be able to meet our 10 million target of the most vulnerable, which will be a key indicator for us now fully opening up uh, the economy. And we're hoping to achieve that in the shortest possible time. But Mutumai, as you have said, it is based on availability. Everything that we're getting, we are pushing out. Yeah? And uh, we have said vaccine is going to be free because we want to ensure that there is no element or capacity of people taking advantage of this shortfall yeah? for, 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 for making uh, deals here and there. Vaccines will be made available to all our citizens across board freely. I think the second point that you raised, Mutuma, is about those who are hesitant. Um, we are not going to force anybody it will be your decision whether you want to take or not. But I truly, truly would encourage, especially those who are in that most vulnerable bracket, those 50 or even 45 and above, those with comorbidities, that it is essential that you be vaccinated. And I will appeal to all those. I think we, we, we have now enough research done yeah, that, that has actually proved that uh, these vaccines are actually helping as opposed to harming, right? Uh, and, and, and therefore, um, I really call upon my fellow Kenyans, as, as the vaccines become available, and I reiterate again, especially for that more vulnerable group, it, it is important yeah, that we trust the science and we get vaccinated. Because available evidence is showing that those who are vaccinated are resisting and are surviving better especially within that bracket, than those who remain unvaccinated. And you can even see that in some of these countries that are hoarding, instead of, they are already even talking about vaccinating children and others. Right? Uh, this is, so, so I, like, like I'm saying, we will not force anybody, Mutoma, right? but we will continue to encourage all to be vaccinated as the best protection that an individual can have to prevent yourselves from contracting 